Welcome to the Bronx Aerosol Arts Documentary Project. My name is Stephen Payne, librarian and archivist at the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is February 23rd, 2022. And um, Kurt, before we introduce our uh, main event here, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm, I'm Kurt Bowen. Um, I've been writing about uh, urban culture uh, for 40 years. All right, great. Thank you, Kurt. So we're here with Staff 161, really a true pioneer. Um, in the graffiti arts movement there from pretty much the the get-go when bef before many people at all had started riding on uh, subway trains um, and Staff is also the founder of uh, the Ebony Dukes um, Graffiti Club really the the first uh, crew in graffiti crew in the Bronx um, and really excited to hear about this early history from uh, from staff today and staff, we begin these um, oral histories by asking people to talk a little bit about their uh, family's history and background, if they know it, um, and some of your earliest uh, life experiences. Okay. So, uh, hello. So, um, my my name is is Edward. Um, Edward is my uh, given birth name um, um, from my mother and, and our father. And uh, I, I was born in uh, 1956 in a uh, um, metropolitan hospital here in New York City. Sure. So I was basically born and, and raised in in the, in the city. Um, my first residence, my um, my parents' first residence, and basically where they, you know, brought me when I was born, was in uh, um, Harlem, 117th Street. In Madison Avenue, okay, sure. where they were living, my, you know, my mother and father were living together there, and um, so I was the first firstborn of um, nine children that you know my mother eventually had. Um, so there uh, is where I got my start in the city. Uh, eventually, um, I was moved uh, from my mother's home, mm -hmm. right, through a court action family court action after my uh, pa parents' marriage, you know, dissolved. Sure. Well, I didn't say dissolved, but they separated. Sure. My mother and father. And um, my mother came to the um, attention of the family court with her children. I had um, another brother born af after me by that point, my brother uh, Adam. And I had two twin brothers oh, wow. after that, uh, David and Daniel. So, at that point um, is where um, my uh, mother and father had separated. Sure. Um, uh, and um, my mother came to the attention of the family court here in New York City. Yeah. And um, eventually, uh, her children, which was my uh, three younger brothers, were removed from her, along with myself, wow. from her, and placed in foster care. And which were all of us had foster care homes in Staten Island okay. at wow. that time, right? Yeah. Um, and we remained in foster care, at least me and, and my uh, next youngest brother after me, um, Adam. We remained in foster care for the duration of five years before we returned to my mother's um, uh, care or sure. custody. Sure. Uh, which she, she was living in the Fort Apache section of the South Bronx. Okay, she moved up there within those five years. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that yeah. was um, when I returned to her. That's where we went to the Fort Apache section of the South Bronx. Sure, sure. And um, do you know much about how your, your mother and father ended up in New York and, uh, you know, before they had children or anything like that? Okay, so my, my mother it has a, a, a Caribbean background. Sure. She was born in, in the... Um, in the Virgin Islands, St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. Okay, yeah. She came here with her mother, which my grandmother, um, my maternal grandmother, uh, uh, with her siblings. My mother had um, um, uh, what is that? Mm, uh, five or six younger siblings um, um, at that point, right? Um, not, um, some of her siblings were born here. But my mother and at least uh, three other of her 
uh, uh, younger siblings were born in the Virgin Islands like her. Sure. So my, my maternal grandmother came here in, um, I would say, the, the early 50s. Okay. Yeah. Early 50s or with uh, her, my mother, and uh, the rest of her our children in the early 50s from the Virgin Islands. Sure. And basically, they um, were residing in Harlem. Yeah. Now, um, after um, my mother was like, uh, like, she got here when she was 16, but after she was like 19 years old, I believe, she met my father okay. in Harlem. Yeah. Now, my father is originally from South Carolina. Okay, sure, yeah. Right? Uh, uh, and um, they, you know, got together and eventually were married. Um, and somewhere during that time, or, um, or just before, I'm not sure, when my grandmother deceased, mm. but... Um, my mother took up the care of her siblings. Sure, yeah. And and along with her marriage and the resulting children that she had from my father. She had her hands full, huh? That's, <laughs> I, I that's, yeah. that's what the, the, the conflict came in. That makes sense. And the yeah, family yeah. court came in and says, you know, miss, you, you, you can't have your siblings, right? Plus your four children, yeah. And at that point, that had created a rift between my mother and father. Yeah. And my yeah. father basically exited the, the the situation. Sure. So here's my mother with her four children, plus her siblings, trying to juggle this this family um, situation, which didn't work out, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so um, four of her children went into foster care including myself and as well as two of her younger sisters. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Wow. And, and what, what was Staten Island like when you were there for, you said five years? Oh yeah. Now you got to understand now, this is now the early sixties. When I say the early sixties, right. Um, about 62, 63, uh, at least, um, um, well, even earlier than that, because I was born in 56. So by um, the late 50s, the court action had probably came in like maybe 59, okay. 60. Right? So you were about four years old. Yeah, I, I went into foster care when I was five years old. Okay. And, and I left when I was um, like 10. I returned to my mother when I was 10, 10 years old. Uh, and that time she was living in the South Bronx. But, um, uh, yeah, Staten Island, Staten Island was, uh, you got to understand the times, uh, in, sure. in, 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 in the early 60s, the height of the civil rights movement yeah. and, uh, and other movements that were happening. Yeah. So Staten Island was like less than 1% 1 1 non-white. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very white. Less than 1% non-white. And even today, Staten Island, it remains like, very conservative type of uh, environment, yeah. but it was it was a little more dramatic at that point. Yeah. And kind of, so so like two two young black kids, right, uh, um, staying with uh, uh, one of the very few uh, um, non non white families yeah. on Staten Island was uh, was a, a little dramatic. I'm sure. Yeah. It was a, it was a nice. A uh, uh, middle class type of environment, working class middle type of environment. Yeah. But the fact that um, we're in the middle of the civil rights movement in this um, environment where there's like a, a, a population of less than one percent non-whites, yeah. who I was a part of, was was uh, pretty um, uh, uh, dramatic. Experience to me. I'm yeah. sure, yeah. But um, I um soon after I say like 1965, 
right? I was returned to my mother in the South Bronx. Yeah. And basically, it was a whole new ex experience for me at that point. Um, from coming from Staten Island, Staten Island, basically mm, middle class, working class type of environment. Yeah. Um, and in a, in a residential home house. Sure. To um, this tenement environment in uh, in the South Bronx, that was basically uh, a dramatic change. Which, which street did she live on when you when you moved up there? Uh, this was uh, a place in in, um, in the South Bronx between Westchester Avenue and Longwood Avenue. Okay, sure, sure. sure. Um, uh, by the name of Hewitt Place, H E W I T T. Yeah. Place, um, and a section of 161st Street intersected Hewitt Place, mm. and so that was basically in the heart uh, of of a section of the South Bronx that we referred to as Fort Apache, sure. and the reason that you referred we re, is we were, was referred to as Fort Apache was because um, the station after where um, was closest to my, where well, the station that was closest to where uh, we were living at was Prospect Avenue where the two and the number five sure. IRT trains stopped at. That was uh, the home station yeah. um, where we, we lived at, Prospect Avenue. And the following station going uptown would be Intervale Avenue. Sure. And the station right after that would be Simpson. On um, right off of Simpson Street there was the forty first precinct. Yeah. And the forty first precinct was the jurisdiction in that general area. And the forty forty first precinct was dubbed or, or, or renamed um the um, Fort Apache. Sure. So, so did, <clears throat> did that slang term come from the streets or did the movie people come up with that name? Okay, so you mentioned the movie. So eventually a movie um, with Paul Newman and Paul Newman was yeah. was made um, about that area, Fort Apache, um, um, South Bronx. Um, 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 I believe, you know, the police... Um, oh, the, they call, oh, the yeah. police labeled it yeah, for the Apache, yeah. yeah. right? Yeah. And and I and that was because of the perspective that um, I guess they had that they had a fort that was built, Making yeah, fort in, the in, in, in the midst <laughs> of a of, uh, um, a very hostile environment, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, for them, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> so, um, it's it, it, yeah. So it became the um, the normal um, label for 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 that that area of the South so, Bronx for the Apache. So, when you was uh, in elementary school, did you start drawing then, or did you play sports yeah. like basketball, baseball? Well, football? yeah. Okay, so here's here's the thing: the um, environment. Right was dramatically different. Sure. Uh, um, coming from this um, Staten Island area, where I was in foster care. Yeah. The South Bronx was 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 generally a slum. It was very run down. A lot of uh, abandoned and empty uh, areas of it. Um, when I say empty, abandoned empty areas, uh, buildings were were. Um, tore down and run down and some of them were demolished um, due to uh, high um, occurrences of fires. Sure. Um, a lot of fires in the area and and as a result of the fires, some of the buildings were demolished and you had these large empty lots for blocks and blocks. Yeah. You know, yeah, so yeah. It, it gave this appearance that it, it was like a war zone. Yeah. And, and there was like almost like heavy shelling in the area, and 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 it, you know and destruction that followed. Of course, after shelling, sure. and it just looked gave that appearance. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yes. What was um your uh, 
the building that you lived in like as far as um, the state of it? Okay, so I was on the Westchester uh, uh, Street, which is the main street that ran through um, the neighborhood. Sure. Um, I was on the Westchester end of Hewitt Place. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. And my building was 858 um, right next to the last building on that side of Hewitt Place, mm. which was 862. Okay. So okay. 862 and 858, right? And then there was a, a following row of tenement buildings on, on the street. Um, but 8, 862 was the last residential building on that end of Hewitt Place. Yeah. Um, before you got to um, Westchester Avenue. And then you had a few commercial establishments that led into uh, Westchester Avenue. Sure, sure. So, 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 while you was this, this young kid, you know, you know, and you see photos of the kids playing in empty lots and mm -hmm. doing all kind of like acrobatic stuff or couches. And, they do a lot of different creative games with what they have. Yeah. So what what was your experience? What kind of games did you get? Like Bush Two talked about playing okay, so, football. Uh, yeah. On the street, tackle, tackle football. On the street. Tackle football <laughs> on the street. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So basically, it was um. An adolescent uh, uh, um mind it will make their own fun regardless yeah. of of. The environment or circumstances, how, how traumatic or or bad it may be, usually kids usually you know make their own fun. So we had games like like uh, Ring Olivia, sure. right, and Johnny on the Pony and, and Skelzy, yeah, yeah. right. Uh, we used to play stickball in the middle of the street, yes, right, yes. and you know. Uh, it was a lot of games, you know, hot peas and butter, okay. yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and um, we used to make our own little makeshift basketball hoop out of the um, the frame for chairs. Um, yeah, we would make a like you had this window on the street that we was at. The, across the street from from the building, the t row of tenement buildings. Yeah. On my, on my end of Hewitt Place, there was this huge. Uh, church building that's still there to this day that kind of dominates that area huge church building right that ran the course from Westchester Avenue to where 161st Street intersected on um, Hewitt Place sure and that church building had this huge wall right and that's where we were like on one of the um the bars are with, with, with one of the windows of, of the church. We would put the um, the the a frame for the chair, what we use as a basketball hoop, oh, okay, and play okay. right, you know, against that wall there. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, that wall also served as a beginning stage of um, some major graffiti tagging. Oh, okay. Sure. Okay. So now, the, the thing about the most dramatic, one of the most dramatic things of, about the, um, the South Bronx um, when I you know, first, you know, came into the area was the writing. Yeah. Uh, uh, a lot of writing on walls and surfaces in the area, which was, it was, I never really noticed that. Sure. At, um, to that extreme in Staten Island. Yeah. It was almost non-existent, okay. you know, um, in um, Staten Island. Um I did have a, 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 a pre-experience um, seeing it when, because um, at the time I was living in Staten Island, they was just building the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, ah, okay. not too far from where uh, I was uh, living with the foster parents. There was the Verrazano Narrows Bridge that was being built, um, in the, it was in construction um, during that period, and I used to, you know, it was a little distance from the house, but I used to go over there and like right over in the construction area, yeah. Um, like like basically under where you know the um the base of the bridge was being built, I would see some 
my one of my first experiences seeing you know graffiti tagging or writings uh, in Staten Island, sure. but um that was you know very minimal. That was like in the the most uh, you know uh, biggest experience I, I you know seeing it. But again, the South Bronx when I first arrived there it was like dramatic as far as the amount of writing that I saw. It was like just about everywhere, you know. You know uh, the exterior of buildings yeah. and the interior of buildings. Sure, sure. And so that was base. And it, even in the school, I used to go. My first school, uh, public school, and um, that's that part of the um, the Bronx, South Bronx, on Hewitt Place, and uh, um, Fort Apache section was PS one thirty, which was sure. down the street. Uh, on Hewitt Place, on the other side of Hewitt Place, near like more or less 156th Street. Yeah. But on 50th Street and, and Southern Boulevard. Sure. Right? So it was some walking distance from where uh, I was living at, 858 Hewitt Place. And that was, you know, my, my first grade, public grade school uh, um, location, PS 130. And, um, I did my first years of um, public school there. Now, in the school, right, there was, like, these wooden desks. Yeah. yeah right? Yeah. And, you know, I'm talking about the old school wooden desks with the inkwell. Oh, okay. A little hole in it. Oh, yeah. 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 So that's how old it was. That yeah. The inkwell is like you dip a pen in it. <laughs> but, so they had that, right? So the desk with, and the desks were very interesting to me. I, 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 it'd be understatement to say I was a little bit distracted in, in school, right? <laughs> sure. um, and um, I just got in the habit of, of doodling, oh. doodling on the desk, writing and yeah. drawing stuff. Yeah. Um, it always seemed to be um, somewhat of like a therapeutic type of thing for me to, yeah. to draw or sketch things. And you had these amazing carvings and writings on those wooden desks. Ah, yeah. Okay, yeah. And that just, you know, I would just sit there and, and diff, in, if it, you know, sometimes I'd be at this desk or that desk and it wasn't a standard desk sure. that I was at and I would just be amazed at the writings and the carvings that were in or on the desk. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so I kind of um, got um, involved in doing those writing some carvings to the doings, right? Sure. And you can carve something out into the desk or you can just, you know, draw or write with your, because you had pens and pencils, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so... Um, that, that kind of writing, you would maybe, I know like when I was seeing it, you would say, oh, Johnny loves Carol, or, you know, you put girlfriend and boyfriend stuff, you know. Well, yeah, you, well, you, you say, okay, so you're talking about like, like general... Graffiti, yeah, yeah, gra yeah, general graffiti writing. Yeah. yeah, this was more or less like, um, like um, some artistic renderings, like oh, okay. yeah, okay. like sketchings and stuff like wow. that. And people would leave their names. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, leave their names, right? Yeah. So yeah, so yeah, the, the romantic type things, like you know, they were there too. But this was more or less. Um, People would like like draw things and, and carve things into those those wooden desks. Um, cartoon characters or they famous like Spider Man. Or yeah, stuff, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, and and see, um, you know, I, I wasn't really like you know very aware of it, subconscious of it at that point. Sure. Or of of my ability to sketch things or write things. Yeah. Because I had a younger brother that. I met when I came from Staten Island to my mother's home in um, in the South Bronx, right? Uh, my brother Joseph uh, was, he just was extremely talented from, from a youth and um, he would draw things. He would draw things on, on site. i uh, never forget like, like the early cartoons. Yeah. Um, like um, the Flintstones, yeah, and the Jetsons, yeah, 
Woody Woodpecker, Bugs Bunny. Casper, Bugs Bunny, sure. Casper the Friendly Ghost, yeah. and and Joseph basically was just getting out of diapers. Yeah. And it was amazing that he would sit in front of the TV, right? And this time we're talking about, you know, still black and white TVs, yeah. the big cabinet TVs, yeah. furniture type things with the big screen and the antenna that sat on top, yeah. you know, with, you know, big with, antenna, yeah, you sure. know, and you had to dial, turn, dial the yeah. antenna yeah. and so forth, you know. Yes, yeah, so um, Joseph, we would, you know, my mother had that, you know, um, and, and um, you know, which was, you know, a blessing in a lot of ways, you know, being, you know, poor, a poor woman by herself at this point. Yeah. And um, and I had uh, four four other brothers and sisters, right? That I just meeting. Yeah. Because in the interim, while I was in foster care, my mother had other children. Hmm. So I, I came into this environment where I'm just meeting new brothers and sisters and Joseph being the one of them. Sure. Yeah, and the other brothers and sisters were younger. Of course, we had Dave and Daniel and Adam, who were in foster care with me, right? They were just under me in, in age. Yeah. And then Joseph came next. And Joseph was the one that was the one that, that was very um, artistic. Wow. And, 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 he's, and he would he would draw the Flintstones just sitting there in front of the TV, <laughs> just like that. That's you know, cool. you know, he'd get a piece of paper and, and, and a pencil, and he would just draw the Flintstones and, on Casper the Friendly Ghost, uh, or or, or you know, uh, Wendy the Witch, and you know, wow. and yeah, Bugs Bunny, just like that. And to this day, you know, he's you know he still draws. Um, so. Um, I was amazed by that. And now, in Staten Island, uh, while I was in grade school, I had some indication, because there was desks like that mm -hmm. in the grade school that I was in Staten Island. Yeah. And there were desks, old desks like that, but they weren't um, marked okay. as much as these desks that were in PS 130. Yeah, yeah. But there were markings. Because wow. uh, they wouldn't desk, they wouldn't those old wooden desks, and um, but they weren't as marked as the ones that I saw in PS one thirty, and um, so I would say that that was like the really again I didn't really start drawing too much on paper, and uh, as opposed and this is uh, you know in, in retrospect it kind of like going that I started marking on surfaces. Um, like that, uh, okay. before I actually really got into drawing on paper. Sure, sure. Right. So those wooden desks, those old wooden desks with that inkwell, you know, were like basically like my first sketching pads. Wow. 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 They, my they, first sketching pads, and so I quickly realized that you know maybe it was a genetic thing, and, and, and but I could sketch some certain you know basic things too as well. So I got into, you know, um, sketching and, and drawing things too, basically as a distraction in school. Sure. I was a little bit distracted in school. Sure. I had classes that I, I, I appreciated more than others, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, um, English and, and writing classes. Yeah. Um, and uh, history classes I, I appreciated. And, of course, art classes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, um, he had these arts and craft classes back then that um, you got to um, be creative. Sure. In. Yeah, yeah. And um, to my dismay, uh, New York was going through a fiscal crisis at that time. Yeah. And the funding for a lot of those music and art classes, right, were, were taken away. Yep. And so they they cease to exist, and um, I think you know in an environment like the South Bronx, and um, based on what the South Bronx was 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 going through, and, and the disenfranchisement mm -hmm. that the South Bronx at that time, 
in the, uh, the people in the South Bronx, I got to realize uh, in that area of the South, Fort Apache section specifically, seemed to be ostracized yeah. um, politically. Yeah. Um, it was like a blaming thing, like because of the uh, high rate of fires yeah. and the, uh, the decay of the, the neighborhood and such and, and the high uh, uh, um, gang, um, gang, sure. gang street gang presence sure, sure. And, and, and drug addiction and a lot of heroin yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, available in that part of the Bronx. And what it seemed like that politically or in, in the media and such that that um, those people that were living in the area were blamed for that. Absolutely. And I, I, I always thought that was so unfair yeah. because what I got from the decay of the, um, the buildings, the tenement buildings that were in that area is that, okay, if those people there are renting that building, you know, the upkeep of the building is the responsibility of the property yeah. management and the yeah, landlord. Absolutely. And that was basically non-existent. A lot of those buildings, right, they were, um, at least most of the buildings during that time were uh, um, heated, heated, uh, um, with, you know, heat and, uh, and hot water with the with the old coal burning yeah, furnaces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I remember the old coal burning uh, furnaces where the trucks would come in um, yeah, and no. they would have this shaft, yeah. this slide that would go down sure. and attach into the basement of the building and they would just um, just have the um, coal, coal slide into the, um, the basement. And I remember the, the superintendents at to have to shovel the coal into yeah. the furnace to keep the um the buildings heated. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that seemed to dismantle, you know, very quickly. You know, because you had to have you had to have a um a superintendent that would maintain that that those coal burning furnaces. Sure. You know, because you had to take out the ashes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you know, so it was a big job to do that. Plus the um to uh, sweep and mop the building and do repairs and such like that. Yeah. Yeah. But um, this, this, this whole block here um, on Hewitt Place was a, was a good representation of, of the decay of that whole area of the South Bronx. Sure. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, so, you want to go? Oh, yeah, sure. I was just, so what, what, what about the people who lived in your building or on Hewitt Place? What kinds of people... Um, lived on the block. Were was your family close with? with okay, so families, the like the that. area was generally um, um, African American his and Hispanic, sure. mostly um, Puerto Rican yeah, uh, yeah. Hispanics um, that lived on the block. Uh, my side of Hewitt Place, um, including eight sixty two, was the last residential building, and my my building was eight fifty eight, and then it proceeded to go up, you know, um, the street towards Longwood. My side, a lot of African Americans, right? And then um, it seemed like it was almost segregated between Hispanics and African Americans on the same block. Okay. Um, and then you had, like, in my building, you only had one Hispanic family on the ground floor um, on my building. Um, and you didn't see a, a Hispanic families um, in two you got like towards the middle of the block near like maybe 161st street. Oh, okay, sure. Right? You had another Hispanic family there. Yeah. Right? And that didn't change um, for a while. Yeah. Right? So, mostly African American and Hispanic families. Sure. Yeah. So, my thing was like, you know, I was the new kid, me and my brother Adam, right? Yeah. Were the new kids on the block and you know in a hostile environment and they it was definitely hostile yeah right um you, you you could be um and we were we could and we were singled out as you know you know targets like who 
who you, where you come from. New kids on the block. Yeah. Thing, yeah. And so. We, this is like 10 years old, right? This is, 10 years old. We yeah, can. Yeah, 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 we can. Me and, me and, um, me, uh, 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 Adam is like one year under me. Yeah. So he's nine and I'm 10. So, um, a lot of fights. A lot of fights, especially like uh, uh, in school, ah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, from to um, school, going to school and back, a lot of fights in school and after school, a lot of fights. Um, and you, you know, you got the um, the street gang pro uh, um, presence as well. Sure, sure. Um, which has started to develop more. Now, we're, this is the 60s. Yeah. This is like, I, I returned to my mother in the, um, the South Bronx in 1965. So, um, this is the 60s, or, you know, mid-60s, and at the height of the Civil Rights Movement and other movements that were happening. And those movements were that were reflected in, in, in the, um, the neighborhood, the street that I was on. Sure. And um, I remember on uh, Beck Street, okay. which was um, on the other side of Longwood Avenue, right? I ran across Longwood Avenue, Beck Street, but um, on the other side of Longwood Avenue on Beck Street, you had like like a safe house for the Black Panther Party. Ah, and it, yeah. Sure, and sure, I sure. remember like you know, g getting to know and and, and frequently seeing uh, um, those people. Yeah. Right. And uh, you also had, um, I believe, on Kelly Street, uh, a location where uh, the Young Lords was. So sure, you had sure. these militant militant groups that were in the neighborhood yeah. as well as um, street gangs. Yeah. Um, um, street based street gangs. And when I say street gangs, the outlaw street gangs. Sure, sure, right? sure. Um, outlaw street gangs were like uh, um, the prototype of say like um, the Hell's Angels type of appearance with the um, jacket. Yeah, with the yeah, the cut sleeve yeah, denim sure, jacket sure, sure. Yeah. and the um the colors on the back which was the rocker top rocker yeah. you know uh, and the bottom rocker and the center patch sure and um even though that was you know in a lot of respects um frightening in a sense when you would like see them yeah it, it, it to me it was very attractive absolutely right now <laughs> now 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 you might say that's that's odd but yeah it's attractive and, and you know and I've had my my experiences before I uh, kind of more or less what, what I would you know, call crude up sure right sure. I had my experiences where you know being the new you know kid in the in the block um where I got singled out right being by walking by yourself as as a as a youth in that environment right um you get singled out yeah. by the street gang. Street gangs are all like like wolf packs or like wolf packs that would like single out a lone wolf or, or yeah. a lone sheep or whatever and and you would you you would get victimized. Sure, sure. <laughs> what are some of the names of the street gangs from that period that you remember? Okay. So you had um major street gangs that were in that neighborhood um during that period, like um um, the Savage Skulls. Sure, sure. Um, the um, the Peacemakers. Yeah. Um, the, um, the Black Spades. Sure, yeah, yeah. The Bachelors. Yeah, the Bachelors. The yeah. Turbans. The Javelins. Um, and the Ghetto Brothers had a, a, a clubhouse that was like right around the corner. I'm like, I remember sure. now. On 61st Street intersected uh, my street, Hewitt Place, but uh, 163rd Street, which was right around the corner um, off of Westchester Avenue. Yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, there was a hill that went up off of Westchester Avenue, 163rd Street, and up on that, right 
all along that hill. Well, actually, on 62nd Street. Sure. You had on 62nd, and then you had the the big hill. But on 63rd, on 62nd Street, there was a clubhouse. Yeah. Um, for the Ghetto Brothers. Yeah, it's like a parking garage now, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. That was the clubhouse for the Ghetto Brothers. Now, what attracted me to the Ghetto Brothers, uh, other than the fact that they was right there in the neighborhood and they yeah, would be seen frequently, right, was um, they had like a, this this Latin rock band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they would play open jams in in the neighborhood, you know, regularly, especially up on the hill, 163rd Street, up on the hill. Um, they had a bodega that was there. Sure. Um, and they would play in front of that bodega, but they had lo- other locations yeah. along in that area where I would see them, you know, they would plug into the, um, the light poles for the, the amps and stuff and just, you know, and play, you know, Latin rock music. And that really attracted me as far as um, that music playing. Yeah. But you would hear it for blocks. Oh, when they, they hooked up? I'm sure. That yeah, was, that yeah, was yeah. a big, that was a, a, a big, um, that was a big event. Yeah. To see that happening, you know, and I, and I would go up there and, and, and uh, check them out. So eventually I gravitated towards them and I started going up there to the clubhouse Right. Yeah. And when I uh, got up there, uh, one one day I met um, uh, uh, one of the older members there, well, not old, but he um, slick, and um, you know, and, uh, um, he uh, I was talking to him and he, he um, about you know his the music and 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 the, um, the organization, and um, he invited me to come for a meeting that they were going to have. And when I uh, went to the meeting, um, uh, um, a person was there that had, you know, very dramatic impact on uh, how I gravitated towards the Ghetto Brothers was um, Black Benji. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, now, now, Black Benji was, um, now most of these, the, 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 the Ghetto Brothers were Hispanic. Sure, sure. And, um, uh, uh, Black Benji was African American, and um, so and, and and the guy and the first connection I made was a Hispanic guy named oh, was Slick, Slick yeah. right? And um, so they had like what you call a, a youth division. You gotta understand that Black Benji was was uh, an ex addict himself, yeah. and he was like a, a like either a peer counselor or a straight up drug counselor of, of some sort and um he was also a member of the ghetto brothers as well now the ghetto brothers they they weren't like the um to me they weren't like the the conventional or or regular street gang in in that neighborhood yeah outlaw street gang they they kind of more or less gave me the impression they were more or less like the like the Young Lords or the Black Panther Party and yeah. how they approach cultural, the, yeah, their organization. They yeah. were more, they were more uh, uh, militant and aware, aware of their circumstances and situations socially and politically. Sure. So a lot of them were like, like you berets, know, berets, right? Uh, huh? Some of them even wore, started wearing berets with. Like, oh yeah, they had the berets. Yeah, they had the yeah. They wore those berets like similar to what the. Um, young lords with, with, and they were into the politics of Puerto Rico. Sure, sure, yeah, sure. and the liberation of Puerto Rico and such like that. Which I, you know, I didn't really understand, you know, what that was all about. But their colors, all right, they had the center patch, and they had three garbage cans in the center patch. And I didn't, I didn't like those. One of the things that that attracted me to the street gangs was the colors. Yeah, yeah. And certain street gangs had nice colors, and what what it was was the imagery that was in the colors. Yeah. And eventually, um, because of my sketching and drawing abilities, I got into drawing different images of of, of those street gang colors. Most of the, most of it being like with skulls. Skull sure. and crossbones sure. type things, 
most of them had it. Like um, like the Savage Nomads and the Savage Skulls. Yeah, and yeah. So they, you know, it mo was you know. So I got into drawing skulls and and, and bones and stuff like that. Right. Um, but um, yeah. But the the Ghetto Brothers had three garbage cans. Not not. I was always like, you know, why is it? But the thing is, is that their thing was assisting the Department of Sanitation and cleaning out empty lots and stuff. Yeah, yeah. For some reason, I don't know how they got into that, but that was, uh, I want to say duties, but part of what they were volunteering to do. Sure. Right? In that, in that part of the South Bronx, like cleaning out empty lots and stuff along with the department because it was just effort to try to clear out some of these empty lots which I think was almost futile because it got so bad with the mattresses and old furniture and uh, and abandoned cars and, and the lots was just strewn with a lot of garbage and stuff yeah, yeah. you know and you know, along with that you had um, a lot of rats and and you had a lot of stray dogs you know, and, I, and to this day, I wonder where did all those stray dogs go? They had a yeah. lot. They had like packs of stray dogs that would roam the streets yeah. in the Bronx. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Packs yeah. of them. Yeah. You know, and you know they would like like move you off the off the off the sidewalk. You know, they would come through, <laughs> and it's like they wouldn't run or anything like that. You had they're coming down as a pack of dogs, and you, either you're gonna move out the way, <laughs> or they're gonna move you out the way. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So um, you had these packs of dogs and, and that would roam the streets and cats along with the cats yeah. and 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 rats a yeah. lot of rats from the empty lots and stuff like that. So it was a very like like you know this you know, disconcerting type of environment for me to come into you know that I just had to you know I had to get you know accustomed to it. So in junior high school, like um, Queens, uh, that's when I really saw the gang. So they, the gang would come with the colors. So they'd be in the same classroom with you. Mm -hmm. You were sitting in class, and, you know, you got members uh -huh. wearing the colors in, in uh -huh. class. So mm -hmm. what was your know, junior high school? Because I want to lead into the to the high school, and then we kind of get into the, the graffiti, but you're going to yeah. be into graffiti before kind of like high school. But let's, let's talk, because the junior high school experience, I felt, was quite interesting. I was in Queens. It wasn't as rough as the way it was up in the Bronx. But you, you started at elementary school, you're fighting, you're fighting schoolyards and stuff. But when you're getting into junior high, it take, it's more aggressive. Yeah, right? absolutely. And, right? And then you, you, know, you, you run into the gang straight on. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, that's true. But um, yeah, and, and, and this, you had some gang members that were still in school. Yeah. But a good majority of them had left school. Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Or a good majority of uh, during that because see they were so they were very they were a little more they couldn't blend in like it, like you know what you could probably, you know, say say of of the current gang situation. Yeah, yeah. They couldn't blend in because of the outlaw appearance. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you gotta understand these the street gangs of of, of, of that period, they had the um the, that look. They they wore denim cut off sleeve jackets and mm -hmm. with the uh, 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 very blatant colors mm -hmm. on the on the back of the denim jacket, right? And um, numerous patches, uh, and I'm talking about like, you know you know patches with you know uh, um, skull and cross crossbones, SWAT stickers, and, and yeah, and other things that you know would would be like to most people offensive. Um, MC boots, you know, yep. the motorcycle boots, uh, and um, uh, big flop hats. They they deliberately gave this appearance of dread or, or, or terror. Sure. Right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and um, you know, and like the Hispanic ones, you know, longer hair or during that period in the African American kids, huge afros. Yeah. You know, so they were. Uh, very visual, uh, in a sense. And so, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, it, it, it wasn't top of mind. So <laughs> I kind of more or less, you know, copied that in a lot of ways. Yeah. So eventually, I became part of, of the Ghetto Brothers, the, okay. young, the younger yeah. division of the Ghetto Brothers. Sure, sure, right? sure. Yeah. And, and uh, under the tutelage of Slick and, and Black Benji. Uh, um, so uh, 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 a very uh, um, 
uh, um, bad situation happen. Uh, Benji was was more diplomatic, you know, uh, type of person. Uh, um, a very um, uh, what do you call it? Um, expressive. He, 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 he was he was able to to um, to relate and express himself because um, I don't know what his education was, but it appeared that he had some education. You know, he, he had he you know he knew how to to um, converse and to relate and um, perhaps what he was doing with the counseling brought yeah. that in hand. But he was um, the person that would um, uh, counsel and, and um, organize. And but the main thing with him was the um, the peacemaking thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and um, which eventually led to um, his death. Hmm. Um, you know, the, the street gangs were very violent. And there was a lot of rivalries with the street gangs yeah. uh, for territory. Turf. And, 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 um, and, and what happened is that um, there was um, an account uh, of or, or report of a disturbance with, with, with a few street gangs. And... Um, um, Black Benji showed up um, with a few younger ghetto brothers, right? And and to this day, I, you know, I'm, I'm saying to myself because he would bring the younger ones with yeah. him. I don't, you know, he some of the older ghetto brothers, you know, I, you know, you know, um, weren't his 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 main focus. He would deal with a lot of the younger members of the of the ghetto brothers, and so that's who he would be seen with. And the day that this incident happened, he was with a few younger ghetto brothers, and I, I, I and I, you know, to this day I'm saying, you know, and that, you know, this, I could have been there at the situation yeah. when this thing happened, yeah. right? But he confronted um, this conflict with a few gangs, you know, um, javelins and other gang members that were there, and. Um, Seventy mortals. Seventy mortals for sure. Yeah, Seventy yeah. mortals. The Mongols maybe were in the mix somewhere. Yeah, yeah. possibly. But the, the main was um, javelins, seventy mortals, and, and, and uh, a few other gangs that were there. And um, he got there. Why it was already set off the situation. Yeah, you know, and. Immediately, he tried to interject into the situation. Now, I wasn't there. I didn't see it, actually, myself, but the report was he tried to interject in the situation immediately and to separate these these um, rival gangs members. And it turned on him, and he was eventually um, killed at that location. So, you know, that, that led to a few things um, that I, um, I decided I was going to do. And that was uh, one to, to you know come out of that environment of um, or that situation of, of being you know a uh, gang banger so to speak or uh, you know part of that that gang street gang and um, um, scene there in that area and also to like more or less focus in on, on graffiti writing yeah. Um, at that point, I had acquired spray paint. Right mm -hmm. when I say spray paint, you know, um, you know, spray paint. Yeah. You know, <laughs> spray paint. Yeah. All right. So, so this, this. <laughs> so, so spray paint. So this is where everything set off, right? Yeah. yeah right yeah, now, yeah. now here's the thing with this, okay, right? So I, you know, this was really, this really got me right here, right? When I say this really got me, there was a few stores, there was a few stores on, remember Prospect Avenue was a train station, Sure, right? sure, sure, yeah, yeah. Right, Prospect Avenue was a train station that would get off the IRT 2 and 5, yeah. the, um, the walk down to where I was living at. And by that point, right, I was, I was going to school, I had left, I left PS 130 and was going to um, junior high school uh, on 52. 52, okay, okay. 52, right? Um, one, one notable 
uh, uh, prior uh, student that was at 52 was Colin Powell. Yeah. Oh, yeah sure. Colin Powell, Powell used to go to that school, right? Yeah, so yeah, that yeah. was the thing. Oh, Colin Powell went here, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, um, yeah, so PS52 was a little more dramatic. As you mentioned that uh, IS52, they call it, but it was junior high at that. At, at that, that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in between grade school and yeah, high school. school. Right, right. Yeah. Eventually, the high school I, went, I would go to would be Theodore Roosevelt. Okay. But junior high school, 52, I noticed it got a little more dramatic. Yeah. And um, the press, because it was like, you know, um, like these little um, handball courts and, and little uh, um, recreational areas that was around that school. Yeah. Where yeah. specifically like Savage Skulls and other main gangs would like keep, you know, keep up residence right in that area yeah so it, it got a little more you know uh funkier so to speak yeah right uh, de you know dealing with 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 junior high school with school and period yeah, yeah. you know when i got to junior high school 52 mm -hmm. yeah. yeah my mother took me out of that school right me and my brother and put us in a parochial school situation that was run by the church she was attending, sure, right? Sure. And that started me riding the trains and the bus, oh, right? That's where, where right. was that school located? That was on Forest Avenue, uh, right? Not too far from from Morris High School. Okay. Sure, right down sure, the street sure. from Morris High School. Yeah. Right on Forest R T Hudson, which was a a, a a a school that was run by the church, right? It was Seven Day Adventist. It was right? a Seven Day Adventist school that school. was run. Yeah. Uh, um, by that church, by yeah, church. yeah, sure. yeah, okay. and which my mother was a member of that church, okay, and she felt that was you know the best environment to get us out of you know getting right. in trouble because you know a few incidences did happen, yeah, in, in '52, you know, fights and stuff that you know, and she was called in and uh, and things happened and stuff, so she seen you know some signs and she said the best thing is to try to pull me out of that school and put me into that particular um, parochial school that was run by this church. Yeah. And um, so, dramatic thing now. Now all of a sudden now I'm wearing a uniform to school, mm. right, and stuff. And But right next door to me was um, was Danny. Danny was one of the uh, um, the people, the young kids of my age that was on the street. Yeah. Danny and his sister, Bettina, right? And they, you know, were close uh, uh, um, friends or associates of my family, right? Sure. My mother, yeah. because they we went, you know, similar denomination of church. Yeah. And now Danny and Bettina is going to that parochial school, R.T. Hudson on Forest Avenue, um, that me and Adam is going to. So we're traveling the same route every day. And attending the same school, so we got you know pretty pretty tight as far. But here's the thing, right? On the street, uh, on Hewitt Place, right? Um, something became apparent, right? Um, besides all the writings that were in the neighborhood, right? On exterior buildings and stuff, and uh, other surfaces in the in that area, the public. Uh, and in the interior of buildings, right, and specifically in the school buildings, too, on the desks and in the bathroom stalls and stuff like that, um, I got to meet some of the people who was putting the marks there, oh. right, and, and you know, and that was the most dramatic thing, and that's the thing that n never ceases to amaze me with um, with graffiti markings, is that. The mystique of seeing the mark continually in different places and and who is the owner of the mark yeah. and what the person is like <laughs> right and 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 why are they making that mark you know and that was a um 
so a very appealing marks, thing to so me to see. What did your see. mom say at that time? Were there different marks? Just the name? Yeah. Well, somebody with the new okay. character or what? Well, okay, so I would see different marks, right? Uh, mostly, it, it was like gang related stuff. Okay, okay. Right, gang related yeah. stuff. Yeah. You know, um, um, you know uh, in, in street gangs, you, you have to have uh, um, uh, a street gang name. Yeah. Right, you have your government name. Your government name is the name, your birth name that was given to you at birth, or your parents, and on your birth certificate. But you you wouldn't use that name. You wouldn't use that name in um in the street gang. Mm -hmm. So immediately in the street gang, I got a, a, a nickname, Corky. Uh, C O R K Y. C O R K Y. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and that was one of the the first names I used to write along with my affiliation, right, with with the street gang. And yeah. that was Ghetto Brother. It was a Ghetto Brother. Yeah. Mm hmm All right. And, um, but before that, I also had Mr. Ed. Mr. Oh, Ed. Mr. Okay. Ed. I, um, now, the Mr. Ed factor came in because of my name is Edward. Yeah, yeah. And and in the, um, the, uh, the mid, early, early to mid 60s, they had this TV sitcom. Mr. Uh, Ed. Yeah, sure. uh, Mr. Ed, the talking horse. The talking horse, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, okay. and, you know, it, it was like a, a more or less a comedy type thing because, you know, it's talking horse thing, you know? Mm -hmm. right? But, um, so I used to get, like, you know, teased about it in school. <laughs> right? I, you know, they, you know yeah. it, it's like in, in school, in school during that period, especially a kid that's not, that they didn't know them the kids, the kids, if the kids didn't know you their whole life, yeah. if they didn't know you, know you from being born and, and raised up in there, and all of a sudden here's this like ten year old, eleven year old kid, right in the neighborhood, right, right. If you, if you didn't make a name for yourself or give them a name, yeah, right, they would give you a name, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or give you. A, a, a image, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. And usually, it, it'll be something that you wouldn't like. It wouldn't be flattering. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it wouldn't be flattering. So, see, so because you, most of the time, they didn't want to give you. They didn't want, want to refer to you as your um, birth name. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Edward wasn't an appealing thing to call somebody. Yeah. To them, right? So. Or, or they would make mockery of it. So, you know, Mr. Ed, the talking horse thing came in, right? <laughs> As, you know, basically what they call, cool. we call, what yeah. we call, you know, Sna snapping. snapping. You know, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah, so yeah. snapping, okay, yeah. snapping is being in school. Yeah. Snapping is being in school, and and you being made mockery of. Yeah, you sure, know, in sure. the classroom. Yeah. Right. So your only defense, right, for that is is to be able to snap. Snap that. Back, but harder, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and and embarrass people. And, you know, and but see, that just led to a whole bunch of fights. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Especially bunch, yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not yeah, in class, out of class, class yeah, yeah, yeah. continuously, yeah. right? Because that was your only defense, because you're yeah. in class and you're continually being ridiculed and mocked and snapped on. Right, so you got to come back, you know, hard, hardcore, like yeah. with your snaps. And so I, I got good at that. All but right. the only thing with that is that it re led to a lot of fights, yeah. <laughs> a lot of fights. So, yeah. you know, so I kind of, you know, became diplomatic with it, with the whole Mr. Ed thing. Yeah. And, and I just adopted it, and I started drawing, right? I, and I, and I, and I kind of related. The um the theme, the whole Mr. Ed with you know, with the horse and everything. I started drawing horses, right? And um cowboy type of themes. Yeah. Right? The cowboy riding the horse, um, the um the cowboy hat, yeah, the stars, right? Okay. The, yeah, um, yeah. you know, the deputy with the badge, the star, right? And um I started drawing that around that on the desk and in the um uh, restrooms and stuff like that. Oh, okay. Right? And you were, Gyms and stuff paper, like that. I wasn't so, on paper at that time. No, okay. That's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm leaving. Yeah. Yeah, I'm leaving like the, the desk now. Like, yeah. And now I'm starting to put it 
actually on walls yeah, in, nah, in, in mainly around the school and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. Right. And so that's like my first, you know, really would say tagging Tag. experience. Sure. Like in grade school, like that's PS 130 still. Yeah. So like by 52, it became a little more dramatic. Now by 52, right, now um, the whole thing with spray paint came in. Okay. Now, okay. now the thing with spray paint, right, now, you understand that spray paint uh, is something that, that's something that wasn't, it wasn't made, you know. It wasn't made for art. It wasn't made for writing or drawing with. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spray paint was made basically as a utility type tool, industrial use yeah, thing, industrial use. right? Absolutely. You know, um, to do, you know, you know uh, utility and industrial work with, right? Touch and, up this and that, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, how it first, my first account with it, right, I can remember, would be that we needed spray paint to, um, to cover, um, the identity of a stolen bike. Ah. Yeah. If the bike cost, oh. yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so, basically... At this point, yeah. So, so here's what's happening, right? At this point, we got this this um this block crew, as Topaz like to call it, yeah. block crew. And on the block crew, you know, it's like, you know, you know, you had a couple of like marauding uh, kids in the block crew, including myself, you know, go around and and we in shoplift stuff. Shoplifting became a major thing, sure. and 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 um stealing bikes yeah from other neighborhoods so what happened is that we realized that the you can't keep riding that bike around if it's stolen and if it's being looked for by by cops. the cops yeah, yeah. so you got to change up the appearance of the, of the bike and so up on prospect avenue we had woolworth and john's bargain store mm -hmm. And both of them had had like um, um, supplied spray paint, uh -huh, yeah, right? Yeah. And um, so we acquired some spray paint and and spray painted the bike, right? Did you hack it or you bought it? Well, no, no, well, no, absolutely. Everything there was no money involved. We had oh, no, no money. Yeah. Right, yeah, right, there right, was right, no sure. yeah. There yeah. was <laughs> there was absolutely no money. So right. so. So, so, so shoplifting became a thing for everything, you know, for, for eating, for clothing yourself yeah. and for acquiring anything. Yeah. There was no money at, at all you can get, right? Uh, later on, it, it, you know, as far as hustling thing, um, like uh, you would have stuff like uh, packing bags at the, at the A&P that was on yeah, the sure. West Shaft at, sure. or, on, you know, or, or doing some little chore for somebody. You know, carrying bags for somebody back to, you know, from the supermarket or something like that. But in general, there was no money yeah, to be yeah, had, yeah. right? Um, so shoplifting became a major factor, right, in, in just having stuff and getting things. Absolutely. Um, so that's the first, you know, experience with, like, spray paint. And then you had, like, you know, really... There was some spray paint that was in the basement where the oh, superintendent, okay. where the, the superintendent of the building, um, had some spray paint down in in the basement for some reason. Yeah, and we got that spray paint. We had access to the basement. They had this whole uh, 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 um, maze of, of basements and, and apartments down in the lower part of the tenement in its, in its backyard. This huge backyard, whole maze sure. in the backyard, and and um of the tenements and and the lower part of um basement you had these basement apartments with the boiler uh, or rooms in the basement where the um the boiler and the cold room and all this was and those those um after the um a lot of the superintendents ceased to keep maintenance in the building or they were no longer you know taking care of the building yeah. those basement apartments where the boilers and stuff like that was became like like shooting dens for the heroin addicts. Sure, sure, sure. So they was either in the basement 
or they was up on the roof. Yeah. 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 And so the apartment that I lived in with my mother and my younger brothers and sisters was on the top floor mm. just before they hit the roof. So there was continually junkies up on that roof landing shooting heroin, yeah. which was a terrifying scene. Yeah, yeah. Right? So between the junkies shooting heroin and the street gangs, right, that, you know, you was always had to be on the lookout for, always on, you know, on the, you was always on the t target side of them, right? And it, it was a pretty dreadful environment. So two questions for yeah. you. Uh, so you were getting spray paint. What age kind of like were you like, because uh, junior high is like 11, 12 years old. Kind of like yeah, so that around that time was the yeah, spray paint the spray came paint. in. And yeah, then, yeah. You being 11, 12 years old, that's pretty dramatic to see all that. How did, how did you take that in? Well, that's okay, see, here's the thing. I'm, I'm already in the environment, right. and I see what it is, right? Yeah. I know it's not it, it's not Staten Island no more, right? Ah. Yeah. And, you know, this is where I, got, I, I have to be. So I have to make my niche, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Right? Now, um... Uh, now, the first thing was, is, is, is learn how to defend yourself. Yeah. Right? So, um, so me and my brother seen that we were in a situation together and we were the oldest of our siblings. So it's the responsibility to me, to me, the responsibility was that I had younger brothers and sisters, right? That... You know, I had to defend, and I noticed that um, that they had larger families like mine of kids, right? That the older brothers were the ones that would come to the defense of the younger brothers and sisters, or you had to make a reputation for yourself that don't mess with his, him, or his brothers and sisters because so and so will get you. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that had to be what you, your yeah. fighting game or whatever, right. or whatever, you know, or, you know, or in the, get knocked in the head with a stick game or a stick you with a, with a, with a K-55 or a 007 game. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was that. So me, me, me and AJ was like our jumping game. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Now, when I say jumping game, you know. I would like say, yo, listen, you see them, they down on the corner right there, right? So when we get down there, you know what I'm saying? I'll give you the cue. And that dude, that one particular dude, we're going to jump on him. Yeah, yeah. Right? And we're going to whip him out. And so, and then the rest of them will know that we're going to do that. Yeah. From now on. And so, so that started happening. You know, AJ became more of a fighter than me. Yeah. Right? My thing was, I'll hit you in the head with a stick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what my thing. I hit you in the head with a stick. Yeah. Right? So, but AJ will fight you. Right? Um, that's your but, brother. Yeah, 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 the younger brother. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh, Adam. Okay? So, he'll hit you in the head with a stick. So, so the AJ thing was eventually would become his tag. And my tag would be, you know, Mr. Ed 161 and Staff 161 eventually. Yeah. Okay. Right? Okay. Yeah, so yeah. that came, uh, yeah. yeah, eventually. But, that's what I'm referring to as AJ, his tag. All right, sure. all right. All right? Um, so, yeah, so that thing became a dramatic um, and, and, um, experience dealing with uh, that part, hostile part of the Bronx. So spray paint came in, in, into play. So up on Prospect Avenue, you had Woolworth, and you had John's Bargain Store. John's Bargain Store had, 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 um, had wet look paint. Wet look paint, right? Which was, I, I thought was very interesting. It's supposed to give you this shine, wet look type of appearance. Yeah, and yeah. So, so the spray paint came in, into play. Now the church building that was across the street, that became basically my my first public canvas. Okay, ah. sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, okay, so on that street with the spray paint for the first time, I actually drew something, right? And that was early 1970. That okay. was around, yeah, early 1970. I drew something with spray paint. 
and that was a skull and crossbones with, with a crown, yeah. right? And the, the bones of, of the skull and crossbones were dripping. Okay. So I drew the drip just so I actually drew that on the drip and that was a very dramatic thing. But the the thing is is that that brought a conflict too because the the savage skulls, their colors yeah. was a skull. Not a skull and crust, but a skull yeah. Yeah. with this here Nazi um helmet on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I never forget that um, one of the major members of the of Savage Skulls, which was uh, the baby skulls at the time, Hippie. Oh, Hippie, okay. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He comes through the neighborhood, right? And he sees that skull and crossbone that I wrote yeah. or drew mm -hmm. on, the, on, on the side of that, that, that wall, oh, yeah, yeah. right? And he's staring at it and he starts kicking it and stuff like that. And, you know, and now, um, so that brought about that that street conflict. Now at that time, did he know you drew, you drew you drew it? He didn't know who drew it. Oh, he, yeah. know who drew he it. didn't know who who drew it. All right. Now, now, this is just prior. This is just prior to me establishing um, what, what I will refer to as a, a, a graffiti crew or graffiti club. Sure. Sure, sure. Now, I mentioned that there was like um, at least a, a few people that I had became aware of on that street, on the on that particular street, that were were gang members, street gang members of different street gangs. Yeah. And but they were all that I knew and that I you know, you know, um, interacted with either mm -hmm. you know. Playing uh, uh, stickball or or, or or basketball on our makeshift court, or or, or, or Johnny on the Pony Ring Olivia, Skelsey, or whatever. So it's still yeah. a fun time. Yeah, yeah. You enjoy life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, or just like um, he was going on these like ex exploration because uh, um uh, adventures because that whole. That whole uh, uh, environment, there was rooftops yeah. and basements and stuff that, you know, we would explore, oh. right? So I had started to, uh, you know, make my niche into the the youth crew or sure. the, 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 the peers of my age that were in that community. So, like, so it was a few people. So it was Danny that was next door. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? And there was um uh 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 um Dub and there was uh, uh uh Paul and there was Kenny and Cookie and Jojo and Skeeter and such like that. Now some of the, some of these guys, right? Some of these guys were like at least two of them were part of the of that whole um, uh, affiliation with the Ghetto Brothers with me. Okay, okay. There, there was a younger um, uh, uh, um, division of the Ghetto Brothers, like they had the the Baby Skulls. They had a younger division of the Ghetto Brothers that Slick and um, uh, Black Benji would like more or less counsel and supervise. Sure, sure, sure. So that's what I was a part of, and along with a few other people on my street. So that became apparent, uh, like, more dominant. Because the other people that were ha that were belonged to other gangs, like the Savage Skulls mm -hmm. and the Black Spades, Dub was a uh, Black Spade, yeah. Super Slick was, um, or Paul, I'm getting, you know, a little ahead of him, he, he oh, because that's his, he, uh, tag, that was his right? tag, yeah, 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 yeah right. Yeah, yeah. So Paul was was part of um, the Savage Skulls. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, I found that kind of like you know this disconcerting that you know all these rival gangs on the same block and these guys I'm associating with, and but it, you got to understand that the whole nature of street gang is just that if you in a community. And you're not like associated with something 
that's dominating on the street level mm -hmm. like yeah. that in some ways and you like traveling in different places you left very vulnerable yeah so a lot i i understood that a lot uh, of kids right young youth um become affiliated with, with those things for like a support base that they sure. use ordinarily don't get they ordinarily don't get like either from their their um their home or some other community-based um uh situation yeah. right yeah <laughs> street gang can be very supportive right for like family things for defense uh, um, and for essentials food yeah. clothing and sometimes even shelter you know you know companionship you know yeah and and um so i got to understand that was a major thing and again like i said the ghetto brothers was very appealing because they were more or less um like uh interactive socially and and and, and um as far as uh, um we want to help the community type thing sure, sure and you know they had social issues that they were backing yeah yeah that that i kind of liked and then the whole thing with a, a music band right that yeah. they were playing you know for free in the community and stuff like that all right but again like i said i attended the after black benji you know being killed i tended to like gravitate gravitate away from that and more or less uh towards like more graffiti writing yeah yeah so so this is on the street this is solely on the street now sure but it it, it slowly gravitated to the mass transit system because of myself, my younger brother, Danny, and his sister Bettina riding the buses and the train to get to the, uh, the private school. Yeah, yeah to the yeah, private yeah, school, yeah. yeah. And so more time on the, uh, on the trains and the buses and being on the interior of the buses and the trains, right, gave us the opportunity to write. To, for the to write on the interior of the trains and the buses sure. so the market thing yeah. not markets because you know school and stuff like that but um that's i started getting my first interior tags um specifically on third avenue l uh, okay okay so, um, yeah. and the two and the five and 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 you can't recall the number of the bus but the bus that went up prospect avenue mm. right that stopped uh, right on the corner of Westchester and Prospect and headed, you know, uptown towards Boston Row. Sure. Right? That bus um, I would take as well as the um the two and the five to Third Avenue and switch to get the Third Avenue L to um the station where I would get off to go to RT Hudson. And that ride, right, along um along um with uh our neighbor Danny we started getting our first tags on um, on the Third Avenue L. You know, that's the defunct writing, line now. And you were writing Corky and Mr. Ed. I would write Corky, Mr. Ed, and then eventually I I got staff staff yeah. S T A F F. And it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. around yeah. so you was like four, 14, 13, coming well, out of well, junior high. Going yeah. Into well, high. I, I'm still like 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 12 years old when I first go into R T Hudson. Okay. Well, yeah, and then you know like thir by 13. You know, I just like yeah, we fully organized in, as far as graffiti on the oh. like I said, on that street you had a few people, right, that I started to realize they were the authors oh. of the tags. Oh, he was telling you, the tags. Yeah. yeah. Again, you, you it's that's the whole thing, the nature of, of tagging. You see the tag first and you get familiar with the tag. Yeah. And it brings the question mark, who? where yeah. and how yeah. right and that is a very interesting uh, factor in um in, in, in the whole graffiti tagging uh, um uh, um scene is to see the tag first and become <clears throat> familiar with the tag and to to long to meet the author of the tag so I started meeting the author of the tags on my blog Okay, and sure. and so that I put that together as far as commonality besides being 
you know, um, on the same block, around the same age. Yeah. You know, um, the adverse of that is that how come you belong to this gang and you belong to that gang mm -hmm. and I belong to this gang and so forth. We on the same block, but we still supposed to be like you would place boys. Yeah. Still. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. All right. We got to get something a little more in common, and that was like the graffiti tagging. Sure. Right. Sure. And since by that point I was starting to draw things with the can. Yeah. With the can. Okay. Right. Yeah. Now. I didn't. I didn't make nothing, nothing of it at that point, right? But that wasn't being done. Yeah. As far if it was being done, it was being done, right? And that kind of more or less led me to to draw the skull and crossbones thing yeah. with the crown. It was it was being done by gang members. Sure. Because they would draw, you know, like uh uh um, crude murals of their gang colors. Yeah. Like on handball courts. Or something in their area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Mark that's what I, I kind of more or less attracted me and said, oh, look at that. You know, either it was the gang colors themselves mm -hmm. or like the gang would like find a handball court or wall near their turf area yeah. and draw their colors. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so forth. So I kind of more or less, you know, got into drawing with the can because of that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sure, sure. Your inspiration. So, um, so you, you you mentioned in the set, you know in you know uh, in nineteen seventies you thought about developing this club. Did you did you already knew there was the ex Vandal crew already? Okay, yeah, so um riding the trains, right, at that point going back and forth to school, now I'm doing more commuting now. I'm not like, you know, going from school right there in the neighborhood. I'm leaving out the neighborhood, yeah. specifically to go to school and traveling on buses and trains, right? I start to see tags yeah. in the interior of the trains, sure. interior of the trains, right? And these are basically, um, you know, it wouldn't be like these like, you know, heavy duty markers like the pilot. It'd be like, like you know, like uh, little dry marks and, yeah. and, and, and other smaller tip felt tip markers and I started to see the tags after a while and um, so I made the affiliation right based on what I seen and uh, knew about street gangs and the tags and marking turf that um, the tags were from people that was in the journal neighborhood yeah yeah yeah, yeah. right for instance um uh Lee 163. Mm. Right? I knew that the number referred to the area where the tagger was from. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I kind of uh, made that out. Um, so I'm saying, so Lee, and Lee was a, a, a very prevalent tagger. And Sweet Duke 161. Mm. Right? And El Marco 174. Okay, yeah. And bug one seventy. Yeah. You know, I, I'm starting to see the, these tags. You yeah. know. And that's on the interior, before the outsides. You would see the those interior, or the in, yeah, the interior. interior, mainly the interior yeah, of interior. the train. Right. Sure. Yeah, and this is like like felt tip tags. Yeah. yeah there yeah. wasn't, there wasn't. Um, you, you will very rarely see something marked on the outside or surface of, of a subway car. Yeah. Right. Uh, this is uh, 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 6970, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. You would very rarely see something marked on the outside of a car. You would see a lot of tags and stuff on the street, right? Depending on the area you was in. Occasionally, you see something marked in a subway station, yeah, right? But um, not a saturation of, of, of tags on the exterior of trains. Sure. But also the walls were prevalent too, like you were growing up and you would yeah, see Yeah, in the neighborhood. Yeah. On the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the buildings. Yeah, on the yeah, side yeah. of the buildings. And especially so. in, yeah. in that South Bronx neighborhood. In that neighborhood. Yeah. 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 Uh, and again, you know, a lot of people, you know, it, the, on this, the gangs, they mark their turf. Yeah. Right? Sure. And then you had a lot of political graffiti and stuff of like course. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. stuff. And it just came, became a cultural thing Right, that if you lived in the neighborhood, you got to sign it. Yeah, it just, it just, that's the appearance that I got from that. Yeah. And I people just, oh, I don't, you know, and so, so, um, 
So, and of course, you know, um, the, 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 the more historical people like Joe 182 and Tacky 183, sure. it started to notice them. Yeah. And of course, those those taggers or, or, or writers are not in the general area. Yeah. They're like more like Washington Heights. Sure. So yeah, yeah. The, the way I became familiar with them is basically riding the subway. Yeah. Because they weren't, they didn't have tags in my neighborhood. Yeah. Joe 182 and Tacky 183. Yeah. So now I'm, I'm getting to realize that the, um, the mass transit system would carry your tag around the city, right? And it's a good way for your tag or your uh, graffiti name, right, or handle uh, will become known outside of your community. Yeah, yeah. Right, because the whole thing was mainly to, uh, um, to impress people within your community sure. with graffiti writing. Now, I also realize this in, in retrospect with the whole thing. Um, uh, uh, the logic and um, in writing um, vandalizing, defacing, defacing <laughs> your community around you, if you know for use of a better uh, explanation, description, or, or, or term for it, right? Um, it has legitimate, uh, um, it has legitimate meaning to it. Yeah. Right? Um, as asinine as it may seem, um, it gives the individual that doesn't have uh, uh, that identity or that voice, an identity and a voice. Sure. Um, uh, a lot of people in, in that community of the South Bronx uh, appear to be ostracized and disenfranchised. Absolutely. And in a big metropolis like New York City, right, where it, it, it seemed like everything was based on celebrity and notoriety and flash and glam and, you know, and, and, and who you are in the city, uh, how you place, uh, how, how do you, how are you placed in the city? What, what do you mean in this big place, New York, New York? Um, the tagging thing kind of more or less gave you that your props yeah oh. yeah yeah the tagging thing gave you your props because especially you see a lot of people don't it gave you your props because I, one of the more prevalent tags that I saw right and I got I was gravitating to or, um, after you know a while and I started to see them was um Stay high 149, mm. right? Yeah. And the reason that I kind of more or less gravitated towards his tag is because his tag incorporated a lot of things that I really liked about uh, 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 tagging or uh, writing. It, 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 it incorporated drawing. <laughs> he was drawing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Our uh, uh, sweet Duke was enough. He was drawing. <laughs> sweet Duke, um, tag, incorporated, um, a Playboy bunny. He drew a Playboy bunny's head, and he had, um, gloves. Wow. Gloves right. yeah, and yeah. the martini glass. Yeah. He would draw with his tag in the interior, right? Um, Stehai's tag included the smoker character, the stick figure. Sure. Right and with the halo and everything from the um the the sixty sitcom The Saint, and El Marco um drew the um the hat character you know um from the El Marco pin felt tip pin. They had this logo with this you know um um hat character with two eyes right. 
which I eventually adopted myself. So I kind of took from them yeah. that thing, you know? So it, is this 19... Okay, so Taki 183 New York Times article came out in 1971. So right in that period... Yeah, I was in, I was in this, that's the signature era. Oh, see, that's the, see, that's, that's the that's thing. Okay. Yeah, right, okay. Right. It, Taki 183, Joe 182, these guys are what you refer to as the earliest of the signature era, right? That's just around the time you're writing too, right? Yeah, yeah, 80, 81, 81, 81, 81. 81, 81. That's another one that, and the only reason 81, 81 kind of stood out for me was because he had my name, Eddie. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, you know, so wow, it's somebody that has my name that's tagging, yeah, yeah. right? But right. see, he had a plain tag, oh. right? He had a plain tag, right? Um, cool Kevin one, mm. and and um, Cool Kevin one, and Cool Herc, cool right? Herc. Now, now, um, their tags were pretty dramatic too, in wow. the sense that they were drawn. Okay. Cool Herc drew a face with his tag. Wow. A very crude face. And Cool Kevin, um, he spelled it K-O-O-L for cool. He, with the O's, he made eyes out of the O's with eyebrows. Right? I like yeah. that. Yeah. And, and, you know, incorporated arrows and stuff, you know, sure. and, um, along with the tag. So the thing with Tacky and Joe 182 and the earliest of the taggers, they weren't into the style of the tag. They were just writing a, a very, you know, brief uh, um, rendering uh, 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 of um, print. Sure, sure. Simple, right? Simple. Their, their signature was very simplistic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very simplistic with just the name and the number. Uh, referring to the area that they came from. The real attraction to me, I more or less came in, I more or less came in into the stylistic era of of tagging. Tagging, not not piecing. Okay, sure. all right. The sure. signature sure. they had a they had the regular signature era was very simple uh, um, um, t um, um, tags. Uh, and then they had the stylistic signature era when you had people like El Marco 174 and Sweet Duke and and, and, and Phase 2 sure. and, oh. and, and Stay High 1. Now the tags are starting to look a little more dramatic. Yeah. And Bug 170 and Lee 160. Though that's a stylistic era of, of signature tags. And yeah. what year was was that? Like that, that 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 is that's that's still that's still, 70, still that's early seventies. Yeah, seventy-two. Early, early, that's like 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 seventy, seventy-one, right into seventy-two, and even you can say like even like sixty-nine. Yeah. Wow. Because because Stay High was 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 tagging in sixty-nine to a certain degree. He, I I saw some of his tags. Yeah. Was he from the Bronx or did he, you know he, where he was from? He 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 was yeah he lived in the Bronx okay. yeah yeah on Forty Ninth Street. Mm hmm. All right. so, and then he went eventually moved to Harlem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where the um, where the uh, uh, um, the Broadway train line is is uh, yard is is uh, yeah. Cause, but he was he was uh, he was initially in the Bronx, right? Um, yeah. So that's another factor. Uh, right. A lot of Bronx people, a lot of Bronx people. You got to understand that the uh, IRT. Uh, number one, no, 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 number two, and the number five train um, would run from the Bronx into the mat into Manhattan and clear into Brooklyn mm -hmm. and back. Yeah. So um, you got a large three barrel uh, area where you would see um, tagges, people who are writing graffiti. Right, would would have access to those trains, the two and the five in in the in the Bronx, in Manhattan, and in Brooklyn. Right, you would you would know that that 
and you would see that well you wouldn't know exactly sometimes off the top especially with like the Brooklyn guys sure a, a lot of the Brooklyn guys didn't write the numbers so you wouldn't know exactly off the top oh. where they was from right like spin mm -hmm. right and, and, and you wouldn't know that that he was from Brooklyn at first yeah right and, but eventually the system came about later with more or less you could find that out that they was from Brooklyn or or Flint mm. right right or you know people like that right you got Flint 707 and Flint for those that there right um you wouldn't know that they was cut the Brooklyn guys they you know maybe it's how they streets are organized they didn't have a number system or yeah. they weren't really prevalent with adding a number to their tag as the people who are from the Bronx and and, and Manhattan right sure because and, and you had a the most prevalent tagging to be honest right um initially it wasn't the Bronx it was like it was like the Broadway lines sure the two and at the two, but the one and the three. The one and the three, okay. Right? Um, where Packy 183 and Joe 182 and those original guys Mike were from. Mike was number one, SJK. Uh, SJK was number one, and Mike. Yeah, Mike, yeah. Was That's the, you know, you had those you had those people from what they refer to Washington. WC 188. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. so yeah. right is corner 188, right? Oh, those right. those Those people... Those people were like the most prevalent taggers of the signature era, to tell you the honest truth. Sure. Right? And then the Bronx was a close, close second. Right? So, Rose right Corner 188 is Washington Heights. It's, it's Washington Heights. Heights, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, and that's where you, you had the Bronx those people. Is already like less than a mile away. Yeah, that's yeah. where you had, and, and that's what kind of got me with the 161 thing. Because I, 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 you know, I adopted the 161 because I said 161st Street intersected um Hewitt place. Hewitt, yeah. And so yeah. I had to, you know, represent, you know, my hood. That's what it was Absolutely. all about. So I had to add the one six one and then I acquired staff. Alright, so you know, please write it. So when did you start writing staff? Like okay, so so staff staff came came about like 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 um the early part of seventy when I um in in the culture of, of the street gang culture and in the culture of the day, you had these walking sticks. Yeah. Like not well not I'm doing like this, but you had the, the ones oh, that they yeah. would make. Oh. Yeah, you guys would walk around with golf clubs. Whoa. With golf clubs. Yeah. Right? And um, you know, you know, a, a nine iron, you know, yeah. a golf yeah, club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um as a weapon and as uh, as a cool thing, you know, a walking sure. stick. Right, sure. and then you had guys that would make their own, like right? you know, you know, get a, a, a piece of a tree limb yeah. and cut out their own walking stick and shellac it and hook it up. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It was part of the um, the whole thing, the whole scene with 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 the uh, uh, maybe the Afro Central look centric yeah, yeah. look with the dashikis because and the big she, afro and the king, yeah. yeah and you had the walking cane yeah. Yeah. yeah and i thought that was a cool thing so i attempted i attempted to to make my own walking stick right right and um and i probably got a little more uh, uh um exaggerated with it than i should have <laughs> right which i did and that's because of I was I was I was uh, influenced by popular culture a lot. What I saw on TV. One of the main things or the luxuries that uh, my mother was able to afford us was that TV. Sure. That big furniture TV that was in the house with the um, with the big antenna on top. You know what I'm saying? And I got a lot of stuff from the TV. And one of the things like the um, movies that I uh, um, I saw was um, Charleston Heston, and oh, you know, it was he's the greatest okay. story ever told, or the Ten Commandments. Sure. And he played the part of Moses. <laughs> and to me, I like superheroes yeah, yeah, in general. Yeah, yeah. The staff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like superheroes in general, right? 
but he seemed like, you know, the more dramatic, realistic superhero because he was just like a regular like guy that was leading people, but he had this this staff. Yes. yes. And the staff was his, his superhero weapon, right? And he was fighting this whole big kingdom headed by Pharaoh yeah. in Egypt, right? With his staff. Yeah, yeah. Right? And leading the people. And he would like you know, use that staff to, to open up rivers yeah. and oceans and, and bring water out of a rock and you know it would it be his weapon. So when I seen the the um mostly the old yeah mostly the older dudes in, in the community like what making these walking sticks and so I try to you know get one I, I believe it was Katona Park or one of the parks yeah Katona Park. Katona right? Park yeah. I got a, a, a um a tree limb. It was tree limb I got and I try to carve out you know my knife pin knife the tree limb but the stick was too big I didn't cut it down like you know so basically I'm holding holding the walking stick and it's like that <laughs> see yeah. what I'm saying yeah, yeah, it's a little yeah, yeah, it's a little yeah. bigger yeah. and you know so but you know you it, it's it, 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 it's second as a weapon too sure Wait, those those golf clubs and them walking sticks that guys were walking around with, basically were weapons too, you know. So, basically, I left it like that, right? And so people was like, 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 um, mocking me with it, like, "Hey, what's that? Your staff?" <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So that was the whole thing that I decided to hear that. But I already, I already was kind of more or less focused because I, had, I wanted to get them. Um, uh, uh, a tag that rivaled what was I was seeing the tags I started to see sure. more on the train like the Bug 170 and Lee 163 and Stay High 149 yeah. and then of course one of, uh, one of my other uh, uh, taggers I, I admired was Super Cool 223 okay yeah yeah right um, so I had I wanted to get a tag that was very dramatic like that one of those tags, so, and of course nobody else had, and that was staff, because they, you know, they started, hey, that's your staff, a hey, staff, you know what I'm saying? They were starting to mock me with that, sure. so it's stuff. The same thing with Mr. Ed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. The whole thing, the whole thing with um, acquiring a tag, is that you gotta understand again. Everything is is time specific, you know, and um, um. And you know, just being a historical society, history has a lot to say um, for um, human behavior and why things are the way they are and, and where things came from. And um, so, you know, and history was always one of my, my subjects. I like to know what happened before yeah. and why is it this way now? You know, and so, um, yeah, so the, the era of that time with the civil rights movement and the black power movement yeah. was like, there was this focus with, um, it was Martin Luther King and it was um, Malcolm X. Yeah. And they appeared to have different agendas generally the same but it's just approaching it different ways sure right and remember I said the Black Panther Party was right there in the neighborhood yeah right and um when I was in Staten Island now going back to Staten Island the the um, foster parents that I lived with were uh belonging to the Baptist church sure, sure. and the Baptist church is where Martin Luther King was um, a pastor yeah yeah. He, that's where he came through yeah. And, yeah, in yeah, leadership yeah. through yeah. that church and so that church in Staten Island was used as an organizing uh, sure. a base sure. for some of his marches 
And I actually, me and my brother actually participated in a few marches in Staten Island as little wow. kids. Yeah, well, yeah. So, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. Now, the thing was, so I had that experience marching, you know, we shall overcome with Martin Luther King movement. Now, the Malcolm X perspective as far as approach to, you know, civil rights and black nationalism, right? And, 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 and justice and, you know, and um, respect human rights, right? Sure. Was a different approach. And he would say things, right, that kind of really dawned on me is that, oh, you know, we don't even know our original names. Yeah. We don't know. You You have the name that you have, right, was given to you, and you don't even know that that name is is the name of, of, of your oppressor and, and you know, you don't even have your name. Yeah. So that was another factor why I wanted to get a name, right? Yeah. Or, or an identity. And a, <clears throat> and a lot of taggers don't realize that during that period, everything is time specific. It just didn't just happen just because, you know, out of the blue, the blue sky. There was things, political things, social things happening during that period with people, youth. I look at the whole thing as a youth movement. Yeah. Because... Um, I believe there was a crossroads at that point. Not so much for the adult, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, black and brown people of the era, but for the youth, because the youth had to get their, their grip on, on where they're going to go in society. So, and that brings the uh, the whole. Uh, um, question of hip hop culture. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. yeah, so I was saying um the thing with like hip hop culture as they call it now, hip hop culture. Yeah, yeah. Right? Now, just like I, I mentioned that on the street in that community where I was, there there was prevalent markings. Markings what we refer to as graffiti. Graffiti yeah. is basically Markings and sketchings and other you know things that's in the public form that was this part of the community it was part of what I would perceive the, the culture of that community to basically mark your turf make your presence known by putting your your mark in the community either okay. in the exterior or interior of that community all right it was just there all right and then just like oh some single person decided. You had people that were prevalent in it, I, you know, but in that community where I came up in, in the late 60s and early 70s, it was a prevalent thing that was this, you know, saturated the community. Sure. The other thing, right, that was there at the same time in the community, in the public, was was what they referred to as emceeing and DJing. Yeah. Right. People would play their music like they people would, you know, just put speakers in the windows and stuff like that. <clears throat> sure. And, sure. And play music. And now, you know, and that's another thing that kind of was was, was uh, um, very like, you know, um, like, you know, new to me. I'm going to come in from that is people playing music loud in the street as if, you know, they are, you know, performing or doing that task. Yeah. At, at, you know, as a duty. But yeah. The emceeing and DJing thing, which they, they labeled that later. You know, DJing is playing records, and of course, the emceeing is master of ceremony, someone hosting the playing of the records. Sure. All right. Um, that I knew was something that was on the street, especially in the early 70s. All right. And what, we, what people refer to as breakdancing, I knew that as a gang dance. Oh. Gangs would get together, and they would, you know, do this celebratory type of, you know, thing, festive thing, and it would be this wild dancing, right? Um, for a better word, wild, yeah. right? Where they would get out on the ground and spin and flip and stuff like that, 
you know? I, I Maybe. heard some of the Black Spades talk about the dances they used to do to uh, Soul Power, but they would change it to Spade Power, and they had this whole dance routine yeah. that they did. Yeah, that's <laughs> the thing. It, when, yeah, when they got together, yeah. and sometimes with maybe a little intoxication or something, yeah, right? the, the, the dancing routines would get a little wild. They would get on the ground. And so I, I seen that. I seen that, right? And again, I'm referring to this this whole social uh, a revolution for the youth, for youth, yeah, yeah. right? As far as uh, uh, um, the arts, yeah, right? Um, um, drawing, right? Um, uh, um, the um, the the vocal arts and, and the music arts and, and the dance arts, right? Right? And remember, there was a deficit. In in in, in uh, that yeah because the schools yeah. had stopped you know ho uh, hosting music and art classes yeah. so and then I I believe there was a disconnection between the old school uh, uh, or older generation of of those communities and what the 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 new generation or the younger youth of that time wanted. To be represented as yeah yeah all right and like i said one of the things was you know i want my own name i want my own identity yeah all right i understand ma that you gave me edward right and i appreciate edward and i understand what it means lord of riches and everything but culturally that's really not you know um where my ancestors came from that's not, I, I understand that. I understand Lord of Riches. I like it. Beautiful, <laughs> right? But well, I'm not saying that, but you know, so, you know, consciously, that's sure. what do my actions. That's what, I appreciate the name, but I like to get my own name. And so, staff, because even Mr. Ed basically was given to me, and Corky was given to me by Street Gang. Yeah, yeah. And Mr. Ed was something that I got from the kids in school. That was mocking me with it because you know my name is Edward, right? But staff is basically something that I I, I feel that um, I took on for myself. Yeah. So aligning with that whole philosophy of Malcolm X that we don't know our original names and our identity, he took X, right? Because he didn't know his last name, right? Sure. And so right um, from his cultural ancestry. Right, and so I took staff, and I, you know, and I gave it an acronym, a meaning to it, because all names should have a meaning. Now, commonly people, oh, what did you get staff from? You know, um, a staff is a group of people or, or something like that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Right, and yes, that's the definition in, in, and you might find in Webster Dictionary, or, or it's, uh, um, it, it, it's the apparatus where, you know, or the diagram. Where you put musical notes on, you know, to write music on, yeah. and I see, yes, yeah, and that's another definition, right? You know, but you know, eventually I got, I made an acronym, right? Seek truth, always, faithfully, forever. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. that's you know, so I made it, I gave it its own meaning with separate wording, right? Um, so again. Taking on that identity, I believe the youth wanted to take on their own identity, the sure. early writers, right? And be known as who they wanted to be known as. And also um, with um, expressions, self-expression with the, um, the dance mm -hmm. and, and with um, the music and how they listen to the music. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, and so, you know, you know that in 73... That um, Kuhark broke off from tagging. He was an active tagging, yeah. right? Um, you know, he tagged with me and my brother. And we on the scene, got pictures with me, him, and and um, and AJ on the um, my brother on the same trains. Um, I, I saw him regularly at the um, the meeting location for writers, which um, he didn't come to the writers bench that often, mm -hmm. but I would see him like um, around Clinton High School. At, at the um, right on the corner in the square there, uh, where the uh, the bagel shop was, it's a meeting place, like a little writer's corner or writer's bench, 
meeting location for righty so i would see see him there um cool herc but um he broke off early right um um just like some of the early signature era people like tacky 183 and joe 182 and such like that right and um junior 161 and you know and l marco 174 and bug 170 and lee 163 right that that generation of ever of taggers signa early signature era taggers were um um kind of faded away and the more stylistic writers kind of more or less came to the front when i say stylistic writers right um the um still signature era this same signature but the signature the calligraphy of the writing became a, a lot more aesthetic yeah yeah and, and dramatized like i said uh, um drawing so so drawing became a big factor with me early on with um the whole whole graph writing scene sure I, uh, not so much that I wanted uh, to be an artist, but more so that I realized it brought more attention to the tag. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, it's it just like Stay High 149's tag was a lot more appealing than the average tag. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you had an arrow, right? He had... He had uh, S with a devil tail. Oh, with a devil tail, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, 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 yeah. Which I adopted. Yeah. His tag was was uh, was vertical, stacked. Yeah. And, and um, he had different uh, 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 um figurative things he added to it, like he would cross his his H uh, with a uh, with a split. Right. Wow. Yeah, I like you know, a lit smith spliff with a wow. with a trail of smoke coming from it. And he had the um the a stick figure saint character, the smoker he called it, with the halo. All that was part and with um quotation marks similar to um what Super Cool used too. Super yeah. Cool wasn't a, a dramatic drawing person, but um um, embellishing the tag was was, was was the prominent thing I noticed with him. Yeah. With the uh, um, crown, right? He, he he drew the crown. He um he drew um grammatical things like super cool two twenty three. He wrote a D and explanation point and uh, underlining, you know or putting a ribbon under the 223, um, drawing a cloud around the tag. So basically embellishing, that's a different, that's a different um, aspect of, of, of the signature era than the early tacky 183s and Joe 182s. Sure. That's moving into more of the aesthetics uh, and the um, artistic factor. Yeah. Uh, uh, of um, graffiti writing. So that's so even before major large pieces on the train. Sure, sure, sure. That's that's yeah, large pieces on the train didn't even come yeah. to seventy two, and okay. Super Cool did the first one. Okay, on the train. Okay. Yeah. Outside. From yeah, outside. yeah, yeah. So yeah, so um, by um seventy one and, and even seventy, you, you started seeing a, a, a few tags that were becoming on the exterior of the train. On the exterior, the train. right? Um, and so it started to build up. Now, a lot of people, uh, again, everything is time specific. And you got to understand the political and social factors that were happen, happening in the Bronx, yeah. in, in New York City, in the world at that time, why, why these things happen. And again, New York going through a fiscal crisis and stuff like that, right? They weren't cleaning the trains. Yeah. Right? Not no real maintenance, right? And that became apparent, that became apparent when, if you tagged a train in 1970 or something, and in 71, 72, 
you could see that same tag on the train. <laughs> yeah. like, they, 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 you've seen that the same tag that I put on there, yeah, yeah. Oh, they, 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 like uh, almost two years ago, it's still there. Wow. Yeah. So, so how much maintenance could it have, have been doing? Yeah. Right. So, that's one of the factors, and the other factor, um, right, of the explosion of it was, and, and I always say it couldn't happen to in anywhere else but New York City. Yeah. Right. And, and and especially you know in the Bronx. Yeah. When I say in the Bronx, as they say that's the birth of, of hip hop culture. In the area that devastated area that I came up in, right? With all of the misery and the dread that was happening there, with the uh, the fires, the high infant mortality rate, the um, drug overdoses, the uh, the gang violence and stuff like that. The, uh, the arson, yeah. you know? Yeah. It, it was out of control. It, those people that were living, in, especially the youth, the youth in that community still found the resolve and, and the motivation, the inspiration to, to, to create their own cultural uh, uh, um, foundation. They, they was able to create their own cultural foundation, and that's why I, I can't, you know, beyond me understand. Well, I, I could, I do understand why some people think that 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 uh, that graffiti writing is not part of hip hop culture. It might not have been called that at the time, but it, it's still part of that youthful. Youth movement. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It, 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 I, I, it's, it's, it's plain to me. May, see, and I understand that maybe if you weren't in certain neighborhoods, yeah, and you, and you just, you know, adopted tagging, writing your name, that maybe you might not have an affiliation with the MC and DJ because it wasn't happening in your, in your, in your neighborhood. Maybe. You listening Led Zeppelin and Rolling Stones, yeah. and, that, and that's cool. But I was, I was listening. I was, all, I, you know, from the time that the Ghetto Brothers started jamming in my neighborhood, I, I got into all of that. I've been into, you know, Jimi Hendrix, yeah, all of that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And um, yeah, you know, Black Sabbath. You know, sure. You know, oh, I okay. play guitar. I play guitar and bass to this day. Oh, okay. You know, and, and um, yeah, 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 you know, I played in numerous bands and. Yeah, yeah. Heavy metal, classic rock, you know. Santana, definitely, you yeah. know, and definitely Santana. It was the biggest one of the, you know, one of the um, major things that songs or that they that um, that the Ghetto Brothers were playing with Santana. Sure, yeah. his Latin rock band. So, um, yes, yeah, so I, I, I I'm, I'm familiar with that music, and you know, I've always loved that music, but I understand. The music that was on the street in my community, right? That was part of that youthful movement, youth, youth, youth culture movement. That encompassed tagging, yeah, MCing and DJing, and the dance style called breaking, yeah, right. And basically, that it uh, put together in a package is called hip hop culture. Yeah, yeah. I understand that totally, right. And I understand where other people might not understand it because it just wasn't in their community. Sure. Yeah. Right? Sure. <laughs> but you got to understand, I was in the heart, the heart of that seven mile square where they say that those things manifested and became what is now known as hip hop culture. I was in, I grew up in that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I have a, a full insight into why, where, and how that happened. Yeah. So, so where did you paint your first exterior? Very good. So, okay. So, um, so by 1970, right there again, like I said, after I recognized that there was numerous people in my community that, right, on my block, not in community, on my block, that were actual taggers, I, I felt. A, a responsibility to organize them, right? And, and 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 so we can be like unified in what we're doing on that block. Yeah. Okay. All right. And that happened to that happened to um 
be other things that was involved, whatever, you know, uh, more or less, um, you know, not to become victimized. Sure. Right? Oh. Right? Mm -hmm. and, you know, you have so many other gangs and stuff and, you know, and hostilities. Well, it was just, it's just that. You got to understand, a lot, a lot of the, the Bronx, Manhattan, New York, the country was segregated. Either it, it racially or with street gangs or, or, or whatever. There's just boundaries. You just don't go over here and don't go over here, whatever. And I'm talking about uh, um, in the next block from you. Yeah. Even in the same community, but the next block over there, that's dumb dudes over there. Don't come on there. Don't go on their block and so forth unless, you know what I'm saying, you got permission to go over there and so forth. Because, not, you know, what are you doing over here? It was hot, you know, because you just had that hostility going on. Yeah. Right? And I, I always kind of like was dismayed with that, like, you know, that's not unification, that's like divide and conquer type stuff to me, you know? Yeah. And um, so, when I found out about the whole system of things, that um, there were people who were actively pursuing tagging as an activity, not incidental to their environment. Yeah. Now, prior to that, my tagging was just incidental to my environment because I said it was on the street in my community. So I would tag because it's part of what, what people around here do. Yeah. You, uh, it's just like, hey, wait, I got to put my tag up too. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to yeah, be part I, of this. I'm not going to be left out. I have yeah, a tag too. Yeah. And so forth. I could tag. Yeah. And then I put my my customized thing or it with drawing stuff with the tag. Yeah. Cause you know, and then later on I, I realized they had other people who was drawing things with their tag and sweet dude and, and stay high, you know, and El Marco one seventy four, you know. And them guys are drawing things with their tag too. And so, um so but there was this 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 whole uh, uh, um, system I noticed eventually of taggers who were tagging for the sake and only for the sake of tagging alone and having their tag saturated through the city. Yeah. And the nucleus of that I noticed happens to be from riding the train back and forth to school, right? Me and Danny and my younger brother Adam was the New York City transit system. Yeah. All right? And so, slowly and surely, I noticed that it started to leave from the interior to the exterior of the trains. And that has to do with motion tagging, mm. right? Being out of station, right? So, some of my first uh, uh, exterior tags were standing on Prospect Avenue subway platform when the train pulled in wow. right I wait for the train and once the train pulls in and stop was tag on the outside of the train yeah with markers right and then eventually spray paint right that's called motion tagging as the train it pulls into the station right stops so that passengers on and off right and then that you know those few seconds why it's there in the station, you can get your tag off, and that that contributed to the speed of tagging. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that built that built up your your propensity to tag real fast because you're gonna hurry up because the train gonna pull out the station. All right? So that built up your speed with tagging. So little things happen. So the Ebony Dukes. So again, um uh Danny who was one of uh, my my closest peers, right on uh, on that street, living right next the building right next door to me, going to school with me, right? His uncle, who again, the families were knew each other. His uncle, I started to get little painting jobs with little hustling jobs. You know, um, you know, uh, uh, hey, I'm going to do paint this apartment with me. You want to come and help me out paint today, You're right? I, and I and I yeah you know yeah, cool. I want to paint yeah, you know yeah, yeah, yeah. and get a little change and stuff yeah, like that yeah absolutely I'm gonna help you paint and I'm gonna learn something with painting too I like to paint yeah and, I like and then I'm getting into paint not only spray paint 
But you know what I'm saying? I, 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 you know, I, I was painting go karts. I was painting kites. I was yeah. painting because people got to realize that I was a kid that could draw something. Gang okay. colors. Yeah. 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 Right. So painting. Right. So anything with painting, I was there. And Bertie was Bertie is his name, right? Or um, Bertie said, um, "Yo, come, I'm gonna paint some apartments up here, right? You wanna come help out? You know, I give you a little something, all right? And you can learn something, yeah. right? And I did. And and as he's painting, and I'm working with him, I'm getting these war stories about this organization, this crew, this gang that he was associated." With, from Harlem called the Ebony Dukes, mm -hmm. right? And I'm just getting amazed with the war stories. And so I become interested and and the, the name, the Ebony Dukes, just, just has a, a ring to it that, you know, I said, I like to know what happened to it and the people that was in it. Yeah. And what's going on with that name? Did you preserve it? Yeah. Right? That's when he said historical and preserving, you know, things that were are part of the history. I said, you're just going to let that name just go away? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's, you know, he makes the, the point that a lot of the people are, you know, long in contact with. He says some of them are dead, some of them went to prison and lost contact. And, you know, so, but I'm still adamant about preserving the name. So I come up with, you know, eventually I come up with the idea because now that I'm learning that there's a system, there's a system that is, you know, maybe not as as firm as it, it eventually became at that point. Yeah. But there's a system of youth that are going through the city, right, deliberately to put up tags. Yeah. Not as it was with me at that point. It just a part of my existence here in this neighborhood, but they would systematically go around and put up tags and started to notice that in the subway system and on the buses. And so, wanting to get away from the street gang environment, right after Black Benji and so forth, right? Um, and such, you know, um, and everything. And, and what was going on with street gangs in the neighborhood in general, right? I believe Black Benji was the conclusive thing, but there was things that happened before that yeah. that I said had number one. The Ghetto Brothers were were not were not um, akin to, to graffiti tagging. Sure. Yeah. 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 They. Yeah. I, I got that impression slowly, and in, 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 in that they didn't really. They weren't uh, appreciative, right? Even though they had some stuff up too that said yeah. Ghetto Brothers, certain, 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 certain division, right? But in general, right? They, remember, they had three garbage cans that they sent to Patch. Yeah. And they worked with the sanitation par uh, department to clean up empty lots and all that stuff in the community. And and part of the, the look of decay, so to speak, was the tags that were in the neighborhood and the graffiti. So I got the impression that the, the leadership in there wasn't for graffiti writing. Sure. So now I'm coming to a crossroads like, why am I part of something that is not really for graffiti writing? Yeah. Right? And um, yet I'm doing graffiti writing and I'm like taking like center stage on that street with graffiti writing with all these other kids on my block that's doing graffiti writing. So we got to organize under graffiti writing. Yeah, yeah. And that's when I eventually asked Bertie, can I, I use that name, the Ebony Dukes, to make a graffiti club? And he didn't understand what a graffiti club was. And he said, well, you know, I mean, you want to use it, use it. But, you know, yeah. You know, you know, but you know, don't make another gang now, you guys. You know, <laughs> yeah, he, didn't want, he was concerned about being a, a gang, but I said, it's not going to be a gang. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. we're not going to be a gang, you know, so we're going to be uh, guys that do graffiti writing. Yeah. And, you know, basically, okay, well, we'll do your thing. 
Okay, so so that's in the spring of 1970, right? Who, uh, I uh, established the Ebony Dukes GC, standing for Graffiti Crew. Absolutely. Right? So that happened in the spring so, of 1970. And what? so the people, the first initial people that was in that was like seven people from oh. Hewitt Place. All from okay. Hewitt Place, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 so that was uh, myself, uh, my brother Adam, and of course Danny, who was next door, who wrote, um, you know, Adam wrote AJ. At that time, I was staff 161. On 61st Street, intersecting the, the street yeah. on Hewitt yeah, Place. Yeah, yeah. So staff 161, right. right? My brother Adam, who wrote AJ, which is his, his, his initials for his government name, yeah. but it also stood for All Jive okay. 161. He also wrote Adam Adam 12. Okay. Right? Like the cop. Yeah, for the, everything was the sitcom. The sitcom, yeah, 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 yeah the yeah, sitcom. Yeah, yeah. 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 remember. You gotta understand, you can see how early graffiti tagging was influenced by popular culture, Absolutely. especially stuff and things that were on TV and everything during that period. Sure. Again, I say everything is time specific, and, and so a lot of people discount that and understand that what was happening socially, politically, mm -hmm. and culturally of the time influenced what eventually happened. Absolutely. All right? So, Adam, all right? Myself, Adam, Danny next door. Who started to write Dynamite One Six One? Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. right, and and later on he took on Doctor Soul One, mm -hmm. right up the street from us, right was Dub, right, who lived on the end of Hewitt Place, that was closer to Longwood Avenue. Okay, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. D O B. Uh huh. Dub. D U B. D U B. Oh, D U B. Dub. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so um, eventually. Uh, he starts writing topaz when I gave him that tag. Oh. Uh, see, so again, so here's my, my leadership role is coming in. That I'm giving people tags now yeah. and, and directing people with graffiti and stuff like that, you know? So I'm I'm kind of like, you know, assuming that role of the graffiti guy in the neighborhood. Yeah. Right? Um, under that new title, the Ebony Dukes GC. Right? So Doug becomes topaz. Right? That's five. Uh, all right. Um, Topaz one. And then up the street was Kenny, who lived on Hewitt Place, near closer to um, almost like 150, oh, closer to Longwood Avenue, right? But on the other side from from, from uh, Topaz. Um, Kenny is writing Hot Sauce 575, okay. which it happened to have been, I believe, his, his the building number he was he was on. Oh, remember, five, seven, five. Eight okay. set. Oh, I'm, I'm eight fifty eight. Yeah. So further up, and further down, really is five seven five. Yeah, yeah. So so hot sauce five seven five or H S five seven five for short. All right, what's his tag? And then right there, hundred fifty six feet on, he would place again. Right is um Kenny, who was the um the Puerto Rican kid that was uh. part of the crew. Right, Kenny. Uh, we uh, not sorry, not Kenny, but um, um, Cookie. 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 We refer to him as we knew him on the street as, right. Um, he starts to write, King Cool, one fifty six. Right, King Cool, one fifty six. I love these names. Yeah. Right? yeah. 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 Right, and then um, um, okay, and so that's then, six African Americans and one Hispanic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, um, last and not least, um, um, Paul, who was, um, part of one of the bigger families or the oldest mm -hmm. and one of the bigger families in the neighborhood. He was a savage was, skull, right? He was a savage skull. And super slick. And he, he started writing super slick one, five, six. Oh. So that was the nucleus of the original, uh, uh, uh the Ebony Duke crew. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The Ebony Duke's GC crew that started there on the block. Wow. And eventually we added all members from all over the uh, the Bronx and and into Manhattan and, and into Brooklyn and eventually Queens and stuff, you know. Wow. So where did the membership card come from? Because uh, you would get okay, the membership so card. Again, so okay. I know when I was a kid you get the boards card. I mean 
the Boys Club of America car and you yeah. get into the Well, the it, it was like, um, again, um, I started to pick up on things that were, um, that um, I felt um, le we were left out at, yeah. out of in those communities, yeah. right? And um, you had these um, exclusive clubs of the day mm -hmm. that, or the whole idea of being in a club and membership in a club was uh, as seen as an honorary thing, mm -hmm. right? Or, and to be excluded from that, right? It was a less than honorary thing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You, you, I'm, you know, you're not part of this. You know, you, you don't, you know, come throughout standards <laughs> of of being part of this. Yeah. Right? And one of the, um, the uh, affirmations or the credentials of, of being part of these special clubs is some kind of a badge or, 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 or uh, identification. Yeah. So, um, I wanted to like try to um, address that, right? And I came up with the idea of making membership cards. So I would hand draw. I would go to like Woolworth and and and, and, uh, and uh, boost or rack these index cards. You know, the index cards in the package with the lines. Yeah. And yeah. and uh, and uh, um, color color. Um, uh, felt tip markers, both a uh, package of felt tip markers, and I would um, hand draw membership cards and started to give them out. And yeah. you did this right away, or it took a couple of years before you? I, I, I did that like right away. Wow. Right, I did that right away because here's the thing, right? Uh, we didn't have, we weren't a, a, a outlaw street gang no more like that, so we didn't have colors. Sure. We didn't have we didn't we weren't wearing colors. So how do we identify ourselves other than the fact of our tag and we writing the tag? Yeah. Right. So I said, well, okay, to um to um certify your membership, their membership in the crew. This okay, it didn't happen immediately on the street. It it started to happen when um. I started to get membership outside of the neighborhood. Yeah. Right? And I had to, I felt it was a necessary for the existing membership to know that the person that's saying that they're part of the crew can prove it yeah. by having my hand, hand drawn membership card. All right? So, so more or less akin to that. A certifying people that it's not we don't know within our, our circle yeah. that they're part of the crew. So I started drawing membership cards for people that were outside wow. of our community. Do you, do you know if anyone still has one of the members? Oh yeah, cards? yeah, oh yeah, okay, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Um, couple of people. Um, wow. Vam and, uh, uh, has one. That's and, really cool. Yeah, and others. You know, from the uptown crew that we had uptown. That's uh, up past 180th Street, sure, sure, um, sure. Blade and Crotchy and 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 Comet and those guys, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't get a chance to go. I want to talk on your next next round. You want to get into some of those little writers like Blade? Yeah, and, so. uh, But um, uh, we didn't speak much about the women in this, but I I know there are a few women in the Ebony Dukes, right? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. There was on the on the street on the street that we was at, right? Eventually, um, there were um females. Yeah, you, know, you gotta understand. Again, everything is time specific, and and certain things of that time ever that you know, like you know, ladies were you know left out of the equation. You know, this yeah. is not for you. Yeah. You know, right, right. And this is for for guys, man. We 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 you ain't gonna do what we doing. Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so you know, you had that type of. Male you know, chauvinistic type of um, mentality at the time. That was sure. just, again everything is time specific, but you had like the um what we refer to as the tomboy type girls that were like they could fight just as much as the, as the dudes, yeah, and so to speak, or just as rough as the dudes, so to speak, 
and you know, and they would you know help bent on letting you know that we can do what we you can do and better. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So there was a few on the block, right? Uh, um, that was um, like that. Uh, one was Line One Forty Nine who lived in my building, mm -hmm. right? How do you spell that? L I N E. L I N E. Okay. Oh, Line Forty Nine. Line One Forty Nine. One Forty Nine. Okay. Right. And there was a uh, Sweet T One Sixty Three, right? Um, Darlene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who, who who became some of the first female affiliations, and then later on, uh, when we kind of branched out in the neighborhood. We had Kivu, K-I-V-U, Kivu K -I -V -U, K -I -V -U 1, you know, um, yeah, so, but it wasn't a lot, a lot of females who were members of, at that time, but they were there, they were there. All right, so, then I'll let you go, uh, but Barbara and, and Eva, Eva 62. 62, okay, so they, they were basically uh, uh, obscure in the sense that I didn't see them a lot, but they was, you know. No major female taggers, right? And, um, um, that were around, right during the period, uh, um, early signature era. Yeah, that they didn't come in too much the stylistic era, or the piecing era. Were mm -hmm. they members? Those two? Uh, no, they weren't. Those? They weren't part of. Uh, I don't remember them being part of any crew. Any crew? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So. Uh, I think what we're going to do, because you, you have to leave, we usually ask each uh, artist to, to to leave a tag for us for the library. Yeah, no problem. So, all right, great. And he's going to film Yeah, I'll film it here. Let me just give him a chance to film you. Mm -hmm. Like 